one of the things that we really actually kind of need to talk about, because I think people forget about this, is that like none of this stuff is created in a vacuum. Right? And we, we've, we've talked about this a bunch before, right? Um, martial arts are problem-solving toolkits to deal with problems that are present when they're being developed. Now, when they're being developed is usually over the span of many years, over somebody's career, and to a large degree, over multiple generations, right? And thus, they continually change. In fact, before the 20th century, and we're going to come back to why 20th century is important, before the 20th century, martial arts were in a constant state of flux, adapting with the new experiences of the individual and with every generation, because they needed to. People have preferences, people have different bodies and temperaments, and the fighting styles just kind of change, right? As you get new opponents, you find different things work and different things don't. And if you're smart, you understand that every fight is essentially an isolated incident. It is a one-off. Every fight is different. You are not the same person, you know, in 10 minutes that you were 10 minutes ago. And your opponent is going to be a different person. And you could fight five different people from the same school and they're all going to fight differently. And a lot of that is because they are different individuals. They are going to have different temperaments, different bodies. And, you know, all of them are going to be in various states of, of health, fitness, repair, whatnot. And so the fact is that like you, you can almost never come up with this idea of this like universal um, everything works perfectly or, or everything fails perfectly, right? You're not going to really come up with that because there are an infinite number of fights to be had in order to continually tweak. What it is, is a bottom up set, uh, you know, toolkit for tinkering, right? You know, you need a hammer, so you get a hammer. Well, eventually, you know, that hammer wears out, right? Or in a sense, you stop being able to be, you know, using that technique because it's no longer appropriate and you have to get a different tool uh, or you have to come up with a different technique to use that tool, right? That's how that goes. Well, one of the problems that we have in, especially in the traditional martial arts world, and I've said this so many times, I'm going to continue saying it, right? A lot of the criticism of the traditional martial arts of what we call now the traditional martial arts stem from 20th century practices of kind of locking things in place, not allowing them to evolve the way that they had for generations before. And uh, we essentially allowed the traditional martial arts to atrophy because, you know, we come up with these, these, these buzz lines of, of, well, this wasn't meant for sport, or this is too dangerous for sport, uh, or, you know, my teacher taught me this way and that's good enough, or whatever. We come up with all these excuses as to, you know, why we uh, are not doing as well as we could. Uh, and rather than adapting, we end up just locking it in place as a snapshot in history and then end up doing nothing with it. And again, letting it just atrophy. And if something atrophies long enough, it will eventually cease to function and die. And we are seeing that happening a lot. But some teachers, some schools are starting to allow things to start building and progressing again. One of the things that we have to keep in mind is during the 20th century. Now, you can say before the 20th century in some cases, right? Because these things do stem back older. But... Before the 20th century, grappling was not dominated by ground fighting. Grappling was stand-up grappling for the most part, right? And ground moves, ground maneuvers uh, were often arresting techniques or finishing techniques. They were not often uh, let's fight and play on the ground continuously. Um, even with, with catch wrestling, you know, starting in the late 1800s, right? You know, going back, if you stem to the older styles that it comes from, right? Uh, a lot of the ground fighting was really just advanced ways to coerce somebody into getting into the position to be pinned. Um, but the fact is, it, like even with with pin wrestling, right? Those matches are quick. They're you know they're they're not designed to be prolonged. Uh, you know, guard play things and all of that. So we really don't see a ton of ground fighting before the 20th century. We really see the ground fighting starting to pick up with sport movements in the 20th century, uh, largely stemming 
from the the, the Kozen uh, uh, Judo, you know, the, the, the nine colleges or whatever. Um, that movement with uh, Yuki Otani, I think was his name. No, uh, Tanabe. Um, and uh, and then um, uh, and then catch wrestling, of course, having all the, the, the painful and punishing holds uh, designed for really getting somebody to a pin or to make them give up. So even though it started before the 20th century, it really kind of picked up steam in the 20th century. Now, with striking, let's talk about this, right? We know that boxing goes back as kind of a cultural force to really kind of maybe the 1600s. Um, we start really seeing, uh, you know, we, we, we start seeing more like manuals and, and formality in the 1700s, again, uh, uh, especially with Jack Broughton's initial rule set, uh, Jack Broughton. Um, and... Uh, we end up with go, going from there to the London Prize Ring, which that really, really uh, kind of thrust boxing into more of a favorable cultural hotspot. And then, you know, from there, 1867, we get the Marquess of Queensbury rules to really civilize boxing. And next thing you know, boxing is the largest striking sport on the planet. Uh, and that's what modern boxing is. So essentially, again, even though you can say this goes back further, like when you get to the point of popularity and a cultural force, boxing is really kind of a late 19th and early 20th century kind of phenomenon. So ground fighting and boxing, as far as their hold on the general martial arts atmosphere really kind of started right at the end of the 1800s and into the 1900s and really started progressing from there. Well, the thing is that most of what we do in the traditional martial arts, especially when you consider that most people's traditional martial arts are Japanese and Chinese, you know, Korean arts, you know, to some degree, some of the Southeast Asian arts, for the most part, boxing and ground fighting wrestling did not exist when those arts were coming up. Uh, not the way that they're practiced now, which means that those arts are going to be at a deficit when it comes to being faced with boxing and now kickboxing um, and, uh, you know, it prolonged, uh, more advanced ground fighting. Those are things that are fairly new in comparison to these old traditional arts that we do. And so if you want to make your traditional arts better, you have to take into account boxing and ground fighting because while, you know, the, the general stand-up fighting, uh, the stuff versus untrained opponents and the stand-up grappling uh, is all more or less going to be okay, uh, we really, really start running into trouble with the ground fighting and with the, the more sophisticated or more refined, however you want to refer to it, uh, modern Western boxing practice. Now you can do like Sanda and Savat and Muay Thai did and add boxing on top of your traditional art. And now, yes, it's going to change it to a degree, but it is also going to make it uh, more able to handle those forces. And you can do the same thing with the ground fighting. If you have a grappling component to your art, well, even if you don't have a grappling component of your art, you really need to be aware of what those things do and how they operate. So at the very least, if you're a striker, you can sprawl and brawl. You can avoid stuff, stop the takedown, and continue to fight. Like You need to have those in your toolkit. You can't just say, well, we don't go to the ground or well, we just use our kicks to defeat boxing or whatever. Like, no, you have to be willing to analyze and adapt to those pressures, right? Those are the new pressures. Boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, uh, ground fighting, you know, jujitsu. Those are the new pressures on the block. I mean, granted, I mean, we've been dealing with them for over a century, but the fact is that the traditional martial arts have ignored them for a century. And it is about time that if you really want to push your traditional art into the next generation, you need to be able to deal with boxing, kickboxing, you know, ground fighting, jujitsu, catch wrestling, that kind of stuff. You need to be able to deal with that stuff. Are these things dominant because they're better or are they dominant because they were something new on the block that was able to take out the old guard and the old guard was unwilling to fight the new guard? Hard to say, right? So, right? 
think about it, right? Go take some boxing classes or kickboxing classes, you know, go take some jujitsu or catch wrestling classes, or even just regular old amateur wrestling classes. Understand how that stuff works and start figuring out how to adapt and make it better. If you don't add those things, you are going to continue allowing your traditional art to atrophy and degrade, and it will eventually become completely irrelevant, but it's not too late yet. Get on the ball, add those things in, at least understand them so that you can address them, right? It's problem solving for the problems that are at hand. New problems crop up, you don't just ignore them, you address them. All right, I'm done ranting. I will talk to you guys later. Good journey. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. Share this with your friends or anybody else who might be interested in this kind of content. If you happen to be in the Metro Phoenix area, come in for a class or just stop in to say hi, we'd love to meet you. Definitely check out our socials and our website that has all of our contact information and all of the other relevant information. And more than anything, check out our Substack. Our Substack will be containing all of the links that we, uh, that we use to uh, cite and reference uh, in our videos as well as uh, exclusive training content that will be available for premium members. Memberships are cheap, but you can also sign up for free and we will have, we do have articles for free and we will have more uh, free articles available for you. It is a fantastic platform for what we're doing here and uh, we hope to see you over there. So uh, I will talk to you guys later and uh, look out for the next one. Good journey.